I didn't, I'd really never run a business before I'd tried to start them. And I'd, you know, basically had seven businesses fail before I had my first successful one. But what I've learned over the last seven years is as a business owner, you can't just have one stream of revenue. You've got to look at every angle of your business and say, okay, what other ways can I generate revenue? Um, you know, and that strategy helped me in my business. Well, it helped me in my life because we had almost lost our home at one point. We were, you know, we were in financial trouble. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I say that because I, it's a cautionary tale. I didn't plan my exit from the company. Uh, I just said, done, I'm out. I'm, I'll figure this out. Good morning and welcome to the latest episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Jeff Kickle, who is the founder of Freedom Day Wealth Management. And what I love when I looked at the site is that the, this little saying that he has, it's, um, it's about getting you to that first day that you actually have a work optional lifestyle. So that is what Jeff does. He works with people to actually help him to get that state. Um, welcome to the show, Jeff. Lovely to have you. Thank you, my friend. I, it's my afternoon over, uh, it's my afternoon back in time so you, yeah that's right I'm, I'm way ahead of you yeah <laughs> so it's, it's friday over there isn't it yeah it is it's friday and yeah. it's uh and it's uh, uh st patty's day so oh of course oh wow yes happy st patty's day great Thank so you. jeff you've got a really interesting story because you spent a yeah. lot of your life actually working for other people sure. and then you suddenly had an aha moment why don't you tell us a little bit about that sure well um it was about eight years ago um i had been in the financial services industry for almost 25 years at that point uh working for several major uh financial services firms i had uh, left that path and gone to work for a smaller financial service firm, um, kind of a mid-tier regional firm in uh, in Texas. And I was in the process of writing my first book. And my first book was uh, a book that was that talked about retirement planning for police officers. And oh. I was looking for a way to market the book. And so I thought, you know, well, maybe I'll do a podcast. That that sounds like a good idea. And then I realized, well, maybe I actually need to actually listen to a podcast because I never <laughs> had before um, and looked for a book on, well, how do you do a podcast? And just happened to come across a book written by a gentleman named John Lee Dumas, who had a exceptionally successful podcast at that time called Entrepreneur on Fire, still is. <laughs> and I decided, well, let me start listening to what John was talking about and what he was talking about in his book. And I became obsessed because what John was doing was he was interviewing all these entrepreneurs. And I became obsessed with this thing. I mean, I was commuting <laughs> at least twice a week to Dallas from Austin, which is about a three hour car trip. And mm -hmm. I would listen to the shows at double speed uh, driving up and driving back. So I could listen to like eight shows up, eight shows back. And what I realized was there were all these people that were no different from I, the, than I was. Uh, they were no smarter than I was, but they had taken the time to become entrepreneurs. And I was looking for my financial freedom. I was looking for my freedom of time to get away from work. Um, and I decided, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take this step. And it all kind of started coming together. I came up with an idea to open co-working spaces. And I know you and I share that, oh, yes. that background. <laughs> um, that was my idea. Well, we didn't have anything like that in the town I lived in. So I decided I was going to open a co-working space. Um, I still was going to stay in the financial services firm or you know, industry. So I ended up um, you know, deciding, okay, well, I'll start my own practice and I'll do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting in life when you, I, I keep saying I have God moments in my life, and this was one of those. I had my last ever review uh, with <laughs> my employer, and it just happened to be my boss and the president of the company. And we had had a bit of a strained relationship at that point because they had, they kind of took me down a path that I didn't want to go down. And it was something that what, what they sold me on when I came to work for them was not what they really wanted. And I remember my boss leaving the room after giving me the worst performance review I'd ever had. And the president of the, was sitting in the room with me and he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, you, you know, I just got to tell you this, you are the worst employee we've ever had. 
Um, you are, you know, too independent. You just go do things without asking. Um, you don't get approval before you do things. And I looked at him and I said, but that's what you hired me to do. Yeah. And that really led me down to the path of the next three months. I basically planned my exit from the company. And in March of 2016, I launched my business. Um, I launched my new practice and I launched uh, the co-working spaces where I was in the middle of building co-working space at that time. And mm -hmm. I left and I and I started my career as an entrepreneur. Uh, from that point on, I, I started uh, my co-working space, wealth management practice and four other businesses over a, a seven year period of time. Uh, wow. Growing those, and uh, you know, over the last two years, two of those businesses grew to the point where I have sold them. Uh, th those two businesses, I had seven figure exits from, and you know, it gave me my financial freedom. Um, mm -hmm. But during that time period, I was also exploring other alternatives and other ways of generating uh, income streams, and that was something that I discovered my first couple years of running businesses, you know, I didn't, I'd really never run a business before I'd tried to start them. And that, you know, basically had seven businesses fail before I had my mm -hmm. first successful one. But what I've learned over the last seven years is as a business owner, you can't just have one stream of revenue. You've got to look at mm -hmm. every angle of your business and say, okay, what other ways can I generate revenue? Um, you know, and that strategy helped me in my business. Well, it helped me in my life because we had almost lost our home at one point. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, we were in financial trouble. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I say that because I, it's a cautionary tale. I didn't plan my exit from the company. Um, mm -hmm. I just said, done, I'm out. I'm, I'll figure this out. And, I had to, over that eight year period of time, figure out, okay, how can I extract from my life every possible revenue stream that I can, you know, and today I, I sit on probably four to eight revenue streams that come in from each of my businesses that I still own. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I guess it is the question that um, not many people actually ask. They just kind of assume yeah. that, that that one business is going to be it. And then mm -hmm. I'm not even sure people plan for the exit, to be honest. I think that sometimes we just build a business because we love it and we yeah. haven't really thought about what the long term looks like. Yeah. Okay, so um, fascinating kind of story to get to where you are. Has it all been smooth sailing? Because, you oh, know, yeah. um, we get taught <laughs> in, in business school that, that we have this beautiful, you know, kind of hockey stick growth and then it mm. sort of eventually tapers off. It doesn't really work like that in real life, does no. it? <laughs> no. no, not even close. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. and that was really, I discovered around 18 months in. And, and I always say for, you know, for business owners, there's, you know, you have that first year of business, the first 12 months, you know, it's all unicorns and, and, you know, butterflies and all that, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're building something that we love. We love doing what we're doing. We're not making any money and it's okay because, yep. you know, we get to do that. And then you hit that next 12 months, which is what I call the suck. Um, it is really <laughs> that period of time where you start to realize, huh, I'm working a lot of hours and I'm not making any money, making any money. and I've got to do something. And, you know, I've, uh, I've experienced watching this from the outside with a lot of the people that came into the co-working spaces, you know, and, mm. and I had worked with, you know, kind of helping and, and getting them to go. And the point that I would watch them just fizzle out was about 18 months. Uh, they just mm. gave up and, you know, well, I'll go get a job or I, I just can't do this. It's not going to work. And yeah. I look back and I say, well, why was why was I successful and these other people weren't? And I'm looked at, you know, in our community as, oh, you know, Jeff's a super successful entrepreneur and, you know, he does all these things. And I, and I look at it and I said, well, I'm no different from anybody else. The only difference is I just didn't give up. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, there were some points where uh, really at about 18 months, which was our first full summer in the co-working business because we kind of came in it during the selling season and our first full summer uh, was horrible. Uh, we had realized we were running out of money fast. And what I yeah. hadn't anticipated was that entrepreneurs really don't work as hard as they should. And we hit summertime and our, you know, our summertime 
And all of a sudden people are like, oh, well, I'm just going to take the summer off and not come in. And, you know, I won't need my office anymore for, you know, I'll just pick it up in the fall. And it's like, yeah, well, I still have rent to pay uh, during that time period. So that was that was somewhat shocking. It was um, I had sort of anticipated it. So I was already shoring, you know, shoring the business up and, and cutting out expenses wherever I could. Uh, but I mean, it was it was tough. And, and we started having to put money out of our own pockets into the business to try and keep it afloat, um, <laughs> anticipating hopefully we would get to the fall and we'd pick up again. So, I mean, I, I could have easily given up. And there were days I came home from work and my wife and I were talking and it was like, well, we just got to shut this down. And, and I the only reason I didn't shut it down was because I felt a, a responsibility for the people that one had invested in the business and two, uh, the people that were, you know, that were our renters or our, our members, I just couldn't give up. So I just didn't, I figured it out at that point. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember those days myself and, and I've had a number of businesses, a couple of you know, nice successes, and a couple of spectacular failures. And sure. um, I think you're right. I think people underestimate uh, that the, there's that whole kind of, yes, things are going along. And as you said, the first 18 months, it's exciting. It's fun. You oh, don't yeah. mind that you're not making money and you keep telling yourself it will come right. It'll all be mm-hmm. fine. Um, but then, as you said, the next kind of 12 to 18 months are when it's really, really hard. And I think for yeah. a lot of people, they just, yeah, they don't have the resilience. They don't have the tools. Um, yeah. And also sometimes sometimes we actually follow an idea that maybe isn't the right idea and we're not prepared to make the change either. Mm-hmm. So thinking yeah. about what's working, what's not working. Yeah. So the co-working spaces, where did they get to? <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, we today own three spaces in yep. the Austin area. Um, we've grown, we're actually uh, kind of tacking the business. So as I sold some of my businesses last year, I started to look at, okay, well, uh, I don't function well if I'm not doing a bunch of things. So I literally could mm. not work and be fine, but uh, I don't function well in that world. So I had to kind of change up a little bit. And one of the areas, you know, I had been investing in real estate, but uh, what I realized was one, if I, you know, when I analyzed the co working business side of my life, um, it was kind of maxed out. I mean, you, it's one of those things you start reaching a point where there you could only rent so much space between the doors. Mm. Um, and so I really had to start looking at, OK, what can we do? Uh, what are the different revenue sources we have? What are the what are different ways we could do this? And how could we raise you know the money that we're making on that business? And so I ended mm-hmm. up analyzing and saying, okay, well, what else could we do in that space to raise the revenue? Uh, So one of the things we did is actually we partnered with a a pretty big time uh, testing company uh, where we became a testing center or we're in the process of becoming a testing center for uh, for, uh, this major testing company that does all kinds of different testing for, you know, IT certifications, things like that. Um, as I started to analyze those seats, so like one office in my building uh, or one office in, you know, our, our office, um, you know, it makes X revenue. Well, when I started analyzing this, even if it didn't do maximum effort, it's almost triple the revenue. So it's almost three X mm-hmm. for those same three seats. <laughs> So right. <laughs> we, we made a commitment to basically convert half of our space into those. And this is really an oh. anticipation of eventually selling that part of the business. Um, mm-hmm. So I needed to look at, well, what's a sustainable revenue model? Uh, what is controllable for me versus kind of being at the mercy of the renters we have? Because a lot of times mm-hmm. we have a company that might come in that, you know, they're they're there for a while and then all of a sudden they kind of gr- outgrow us. And so we're okay, always yeah. on this never ending cycle of replacing people and then getting new ones in and all that. So mm-hmm. this was a way to have some revenue that I felt like I at least had some control over um, yeah. from that perspective. And then the other side of it is I started to look at, well, you know, hell, we're a real estate company <laughs> and I've been doing real estate you know, and on the side as my own side business. So I decided, well, you know what, we're going to become a real estate. Yeah, you know, we're going to just take the real estate to the next level. So, you know, mm. this is that whole, okay, what other revenue sources, what other things can you yeah. do within that company? And that's really, you know, this year has been extremely successful at that. 
uh, we mm-hmm. launched a real estate wholesaling operation. Uh, so this was something that when I was selling my business, I just had a bunch of time on my hands. And mm-hmm. so I literally took every real estate course I could, read every book I could. And I came up with the idea of starting a real estate wholesale operation. So, you know, we go out and we find a residential property, basically, that is not pretty, um, yep. but it's something that could be fixed. Uh, we gain control of that. And then we sell that to another real estate investor that's uh, down the food chain from us. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one way we are also uh, doing midterm rentals. So we've acquired some properties through different ways and we're doing midterm rentals. So you have short term rentals like Airbnb and you have long term rentals, which is, you know, the traditional rental market. Well, there's this kind of interesting spot in between between for people that are that need a, you know, need a place to stay for 30 days beyond. Uh, typically mm-hmm. up to a year maximum. And we started to market those properties to traveling nurses, which is a, a oh. major thing in the United States. Uh, traveling yes. nurses, you know, there's like 2.5 million of them in the United States. And they, you know, they travel on like 13 week contracts to different places. So hospitals that need more staff, they'll hire yeah. them to come in and they're basically a hired gun and yeah. they don't want to live in a hotel. State. Yeah. And they don't want to live in a hotel for, you know, 13 weeks. So they typically are looking for a furnished apartment or house or something Mm -hmm. like that. Sometimes they have kids or pets and they they just want to be more comfortable and feel like they have a home. And so we found I found that little way of doing things. And it's it's actually a very profitable way of doing Mm -hmm. things. It's it's the profit level is very similar to the Airbnb model without the the trouble Short of every three over. days. Yeah. You're turning them over every, you know, and you're constantly cleaning these places. I mean, we clean them once every three months instead. Yep. So it's, it's yeah, just awesome. a lot of fun. I, I, actually, I actually had a similar idea a few years ago and my market was actually a much more niche. It was at the divorce market because I kind of realized that yeah. often when you get divorced, you know, you, you end up splitting up and yeah. you need somewhere to go, but it's only for, it's for maybe three to three months to mm. 12 months, depending on how long the divorce takes and depending on Absolutely. what's going on. And you want to have your pets, you want to have your home yep. comforts. Um, and you just, but you don't need to buy or rent a place long term. Yep. So interesting. Once again, you don't yeah. want to live in a hotel for that time no, period. No. Um, you know, we Absolutely. found a couple times too, people that maybe their home got destroyed by a fire or something. So they have mm-hmm. nothing. And yep. they, you know, they, they're trying to rebuild their lives, rebuild their homes. And, you know, it's a place that, hey, they can come in. Most times the insurance company actually pays us directly in mm-hmm. those cases okay. for, for housing them for that time period. I love it. Yeah. Hey, it takes me back to my days when I was running the common co-working space. And I, I, mm-hmm. I had a similar moment where after 18 months, we were starting to kind of break even, but it was yep. really tough because as you said, you're always looking to people to replace the people that in there, you had a limited number of desks and we had to kind of pivot a wee bit too and go, what else can we do with this space? And so we actually um, ended up going up. We took a big chunk of the space and actually converted it into an event center and installed a bar and, and had mm-hmm. high end kind of business events. That was a very unusual building. Yeah. Um, but I have to be honest, it wasn't me that that kind of came up with that idea. Mm-hmm. I was actually feeling a bit kind of like, oh, this isn't working. What am I going to do? And I actually brought some some um, an advisory board team together oh, to say, nice. hey, give me some ideas, help me with yeah. that. Because sometimes it can be tough, right? Because you're so so in there fighting the fires, trying to keep the fires burning, if you like. Um, yeah. what, do you, what do you suggest people do when they're feeling like that? Well, and I, I think you said it perfectly. You had an advisory board. Um, yep. You know, what I, what I have done, really what I discovered – Early in my career, I always have I've always had mentors. Um, I've always mm-hmm. had coaches. Uh, so I've paid yep. for coaches and mentors uh, throughout that time period. And, you know, I think for me, one of the things that I did when when I was really looking at, OK, well, what else can we do? What else can we tack to? What are some other ideas? You know, at those early days, holy crap. You know, I, I don't know where money's going to come from. You know, I was still paying for a coach. Uh, yep. who I worked with. And, you know, Stan, Stan was always, he was the guy that always said, you know, I, I can't teach you how to do your business better. But what mm-hmm. I've always said about Stan was he made me a better me at that point. Right. So he was able to kind of pull me out of me and get myself out of the way 
which is what a good coach does. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've paid for business consultants to come in, both good and bad, uh, <laughs> to look at yeah. the business and say, OK, well, what can we do? Uh, but I've always had mentors. And I think that's one of the real critical things. Uh, being a, a CEO, a president is probably one of the loneliest jobs you're ever mm -hmm. going to have. Uh, because it's not something that, you know, I've been fortunate because in my co-working business, my wife has been my business partner for almost six of the seven years. And, oh, wow. you know, she I, I get to go home and we can kind of blow stuff off. And I mean, we both we both have our days where we come home and it's just like, ah, I can't take it anymore. Blah, 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 like that, <laughs> um, you know, and, and the other one's kind of sitting there going, all right, all right, all right, let you know, let it out and then we go. So we've been fortunate from that perspective, but not everybody mm -hmm. has that. And the problem with being the CEO of a company is it's not like you can go to any of the people that work for you and go, holy crap, I don't know how we're going to keep this thing alive uh, because they tend to then leave and go away because they're mm -hmm. worried about their paycheck. So I yeah. think you need to find people who, you know, I, I look at, I, I have a three stage world when it comes to the people that I interact with. Um, I mm -hmm. always have a group of peers that I hang out with. So we yeah. we can at least share, you know, hey, we're all out fighting alligators in the alligator pit. What you know, what's what are you doing? What are what am I doing? I've always had mm -hmm. people that are mentors who I've looked up to who are where I want to be. So I'm always mm -hmm. looking for those kind of people. And then, you know, I look at giving back to. So I do a lot of mentoring for, you know, entrepreneurs that are not where I'm at um, mm -hmm. and want to be where I'm at. And so I just kind of break my I break my interaction time up into those three different groups. And that's been helpful for me, quite frankly, through masterminds and and, you know, mentorships and I don't necessarily look for coaches anymore because I look for mm. I hire mentors uh, <laughs> because I look at a coach sometimes is somebody who may or may not have actually done what I do. Mm -hmm. And are they theoretically talking about this? They're, they're talking about the, the theory, but mentors that I hire, they're they're actually out there doing it. Doing it. Um, yeah. and that's it's actually one of my, it's yeah. one of my bugbears. It's like yeah. the, the, you, anybody can actually call themselves a coach and you can go oh, to yeah. a coaching course and you have all the theory in the world. What I loved about EOS and the reason I kind of joined them was they have a, mm -hmm. um, that all of their EOS implementers actually have to have, be business owners yeah. or have been business owners. And so if we're both a coach and a mentor in that role, Absolutely. I think that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. And every EOS implementer I've worked with, I mean, they've always been somebody that has been, they've been there or they're still yeah. there. You know, mm, and, and yeah. they are really anyhow because they're building their EOS business on top of it. Um, yes, true. So, you know, I mean, it's it's true from that perspective. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing I've always loved about EOS is, yeah. OK, these are people that have taken the time to learn, you know, the model of EOS. But they've also brought a crap ton of experience <laughs> before that <laughs> of both yep. good and bad. I mean, you know, you're yeah. a great example of that when you're on my podcast. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you've had great experiences and you've had you know tough times and you, uh, you were running a co-working space in the middle of a pandemic which just <laughs> is awful um but you bring all of that when you're sitting down with your clients so i mean you know, i always recommend people and, and i and really lately more i would say over the last two to three years i've hired what I call mentors and I've hi mm. hired mentors, not just gone not to them and said, Hey, special. I expect you to just give to me. Um, I'm going to pay you and I really mm -hmm. want your honest advice. And what I find from hiring mentors is they don't have time for BS. Um, mm. They're not sitting there and saying, Oh, well let's, you know, let's coach for six months and I'll walk you through and I'll be your you know accountability partner. You know, the mentors yeah. I've hired have been pretty brutal and mm. they, they don't suffer fools. So when, you know, when I go to them and say, well, I didn't get that done what I told you I was going to do because I was so busy and they look at me and go, well, I'm not, 
you know, and you're wasting my, <laughs> yeah, you're wasting my time. Yeah, wasting my time. Yeah, yeah. It was a and I mean, I can make yeah. a lot more money doing what I do for a living than helping you right now. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, you know, it's helped me to then be, okay, I'm really accountable and I, I value what these people do. I'm willing to spend the money with them and I value what they do. And I don't want to lose access to that because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. It's what the advisory board, I paid for it as well. Yep. A similar thing. You kind of look at your strengths and weaknesses and go, where am I weak? What do I need somebody to hold me mm-hmm. accountable for? Who's been yeah. there, done that in that particular area, that particular skill set, and have them to hold you accountable? I want to talk a little bit about peer groups as well, though, because peer groups are yeah. actually really, really interesting. And I, I've, I've been a member of EO. I've been a member of, yep. um, you know, I've been involved with tech and things like that. And I think that it's actually really important. And we run some masterminds ourselves for some of our clients. Mm-hmm. And I, we just had one yesterday. And I have to say, every time I run these things, I actually get to learn too so yeah. you know it's just that being in a room with people who are, are going through it or doing it um it's just such a great way to tap into other people's experience well, and, and especially if you get and you know i've been invited to multiple masterminds over the years and what mm-hmm. i always tell people is i i don't really always like masterminds because i'm typically the most motivated person in the room and what <laughs> yep. i found over the years was it all became well what Jeff, what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, okay, well, what are you doing? Um, mm-hmm. And like I said, it would be some of those ist- instances where uh, I typically today, if I'm going to be part of a mastermind, I probably am going to spend ten to $20,000 a year in that yeah. mastermind. And I'm going to be in there with people that are like me. Um, yeah, in fact, they're, they're, they're people that aren't like me because they're people that are so motivated that I get in there and I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm an idiot. I mean, I'm, I don't even know what I'm doing. I mean, you're making millions of dollars a year and you're yeah. doing all this and you've got, you know, all this successful stuff going on. Why am I in this room? Um, but that's, you know, that's, I think, to take it to that next level. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm at that point right now in my own personal life. Um, you know, I, I really... The whole Freedom Day stuff, all the, all the stuff around Freedom Day really started to coalesce last summer when my uh, business partner wanted to buy me out of our practice, our financial practice, because I didn't really fit anymore. I was I was really tacking oh. over to a different thing that just, you know, it was a round peg in a square hole and it wasn't going to work. And he felt like I was kind of distracted from what we were doing within the practice, which I really was. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it allowed me then to say, okay, what is it, you know, if I were to just say I'm going to restart over and I'm going to do things a different way in my life and I want to work with people and help them achieve their freedom day, well, what would I need to do? And that's really what I've spent the last eight months working on. Um, I think when you and I talked, I told you I was working on a book still working yes. on the book um, mainly <laughs> because what I what I started to discover as I was writing I'm like crap I don't know all the pieces of the story and not mm-hmm. all the pieces had been put together they were kind of out there and I had to figure out how they all went together and that's really been the last I would say five months was pulling the pieces together and seeing how they fit and then looking at okay now how do I get all these disparate pieces of my life that I've had for really the last seven years? How do I get those all into one common thing, which is something that I have not been for the last seven years? How do I get into a common thing? So from the communications perspective, OK, I do a podcast. I do, you know, I have a YouTube channel. I, I write books. I write articles. I have web pages. OK, how do all those coalesce into that Freedom Day story and how does that then get to the end client? Um, mm. And I think that's important. I think a lot of businesses, as they start adding things, and I did this, you mm. got to make sure that those are all kind of pulling in the same direction. And and that was yeah. with the old practice, I wasn't pulling in the same direction anymore because I didn't really, what we were doing with my old practice was the old way of doing things. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think the old way of doing things works anymore in the financial world. Um, I think you have to think of cash flow first instead of amassing dollar amounts. Well, that's something that if you're a wealth manager, the only way you get paid is to amass (laughs) dollar amounts. (laughs) 
mm-hmm. and not necessarily yes. <laughs> to help people create you know revenue streams. The cash flow, yeah, yeah, and cash flow. And so that was kind of what I had to extract myself from. Now I still file. I still built a wealth management practice. I do have that now, uh, but mm-hmm. the wealth management practice is just a small piece of what I do for my clients. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I put together strategies. I help them if they want to get into real estate, I help them do that. If they want to start businesses, you know, I'll help guide them. But then I work with partners like you that, you know, it's like, okay, you've got this business up and running, but how are you going to get it to where you want to be? And I don't want to do that. That's not my skill set. And I'm not going to be good at that. That's just not what I, what I enjoy. So I work with partners that can help kind of move them along the path. Um, You know, and the other side of things, I work with a lot of business owners that were who I was. You know, if you looked at me Mm. prior to the pandemic, I was working typically I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning, um, get up at I'd be at work by about seven, seven thirty. I would work until like seven o'clock at night, uh, all the way through. I would take, I'd eat, yep. but I'd eat at my desk. At the desk. Um, yep. And I just, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> you know, I focused my whole day on work. If you looked at my calendar, it looked like a fruit salad because it was all these different colors on it. And every minute of my day was accounted for. Um, mm-hmm. And I would come home and I'd have dinner with my wife, you know, for like 30 minutes. We'd clean the dishes up. And then I would start working from, let's say, 8 p.m. until 11 and, you know, rinse and repeat every day. And then every Mm -hmm. Saturday, every Sunday, we might go out and do a little bit of running around in the morning. I would come back and I would be working the rest of the day. So I was working 70, 80 hour weeks. Um, I was beat down, but I I just am one of these people that can keep up that pace. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, it was interesting because all of a sudden everything went and stopped overnight. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was like, you know, with the co-working spaces, well, nobody was in uh, except for <laughs> yeah. the the, you know, the few people that had rented space. They were coming in on a regular basis. We were still we had most of our people still with us. Uh, we okay. started to add new people in. But, you know, we're like, well, most people, you know, we were having to do all this idiotic cleaning, which we now realize was completely worthless. Um, mm, yeah. But. You know, we said, well, okay, we'll open from instead of eight until five, we'll open from nine to four. And that gave us enough time at the beginnings of the end of the day to clean. Well, Mm -hmm. after the pandemic kind of started to subside, we're like, why are we opening before nine o'clock? And why are we staying open after four? Because nobody comes, you know, most of the time, nobody would come in until nine. If they wanted to, they are, most of those people had 24 hour access, so they can come and go as they please. After 4 p.m., most of the people that were there, you know, that didn't have 24 hour access were already gone. So why are we mm-hmm. stay, staying open after those times? So all of a sudden yeah. I went from, OK, I was working seven until seven. Now, all of a sudden I'm working from nine until four. And I realized there mm-hmm. was actually a life outside of work. <laughs> and yeah. I then started to look at, OK, what am I doing and I realized in a lot of my life, and this this was kind of a, a sore point with my business partner, because what happened, especially during the pandemic, like all of our staff started working from home. And this was in the financial practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, my business partner and I were the only two that were there for a long time. And the staff all of a sudden started to take advantage of that and say, oh, well, yeah, if you need to drop in a check, you know, Jeff will be there at the office. Jeff can do that. Jeff can do this. And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, why am I working so hard and everybody else isn't? I'm being delegated mm-hmm. to and I run the place. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> I, I flipped the gears on them and I, you know, kind of redesigned my life and said, no, you're going to work on this. And if a, somebody's dropped by a check, you better get your butt here to the office because I'm not going to be here to do mm-hmm. that. And that kind of started to create a little bit of a rub with my with my employees but I didn't really care anymore. I was I was looking at I'm not going to live the life that I was living. And that was the big change for me. And and so I I now do a uh, I, I do a keynote speech that I call procrastination for fun and profit, um, which is really OK. OK. How do you how do you fix your life? If you are that person that was me where your mm. schedule was all covered up, you know, and you, you had everything planned out for the day. Um, just use a simple acronym 
in your life. And so this is what procrastination for fun and profit is. Use the, the acronym IDEA. So I-D-E-A. Yeah. So yeah. one idea, the first thing is identify. So identify yeah. what's coming in at you. Don't take action on it, but identify what's coming in at you. Mm -hmm. Then you take that, what it's coming in at you, and the first thing is delegate. So I might right. have a task list of everything that's kind of coming at me for the day, and instantly I go through that and say, okay, this can be delegated to my wife. She can handle that. This can be delegated to my virtual assistant in the Philippines. This can be delegated uh, to my um, to my, you know, one of my other community managers that works for me and does social media stuff. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Done. That's off my plate. Now, the remaining things that are on there, what can be eliminated? Okay, is this just mm -hmm. something stupid that we just keep doing and there's no reason for it? Um, a great example of this is um, my email. So I used to get on, a, on every single day, I would get about six to 700 emails. So I had about right. six, you know, eight different email accounts for different businesses. And I would get about 800 emails a day. And what would happen is I just wouldn't take any action on them. So I would have, <laughs> you know, then 800 turned into 1600, then to 2400. And it was just this yep. never ending thing. And I would eventually just go, oh, and I'd go through and, you know, I would realize as I'm looking through all these things, there are newsletters that people sign me up for. I, people just automatically made my name part of their, their list and all these things mm -hmm. that kept building and building and building. And really only about a quarter or less of the or messages less. I was yeah. receiving were worth anything. So I found this tool uh, that I was able to go in and it basically uh, it was called Unroll. And unroll, mm -hmm. you can go in, you can sign your email unsubscribe. account into it, and it goes through and it helps you unsubscribe from all these things. So yep. I went from 800 emails a day now down to about, I'd say, less than 100 at that okay. point between yep. eight email accounts. And there are all actionable things that mm -hmm. I need to do. Okay, so that was eliminate from my life. Then the yep. last thing is automate. Um, you know, I'll give you an example in my financial practice. So I'm part of a, a lead uh, generation group that generates leads. And what I was finding is, and I, I saw this back in my old firm, what happens is, you know, they, they generate at least one to two leads per day. Well, that's fine. It's easy to manage one to two leads per day until yep. you get two leads today two leads tomorrow, two leads after that, and you're not getting a hold of the clients. So all of a sudden now I'm getting bold, you know, bold under our solution with my old firm was, well, we just need to hire another person and we need to hire another person. Well, what I ended yeah. up doing with that, with my new business, I was like, well, I don't really want to hire any more people. I want to run this for as long as I can with just me. So I just simply created an automation that does everything for me. So mm -hmm. I get I get a lead in, I put them into the lead system. It actually does outbound, it actually makes an outbound call and leaves a message. Oh, wow. It does yeah. a, uh, it sends an email, it sends a text. And then I have kind of a 14 day process where it's sending texts and emails and, and outbound phone calls and all that. So I don't do anything at that point. Yeah, yeah, and nice. I've found that, it's almost, I'm still tweaking it, but it's almost as mm -hmm. effective what, as what I was doing it. So yeah. I'm typically, okay. I'm converting about 50% of those leads into conversations, which is about where we were when I was sitting there making phone calls all day. That's fantastic. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to do a quick summary of what we talked about. There's a few things yep. here that I think are really important. So the first thing was like, make sure you're looking for multiple streams in your business place, right? So what are the Absolutely. different multiple streams you can look at? The next one, I, I want to use a bit of a sports analogy. It's like play when you play tennis, and I'm a big tennis yeah. fan, you know, you should play with somebody who's better than you yep. because that is the only way you can actually improve your game. So surround, so surround yourself with people who are either at a similar level or, or, or better than you so that you can actually improve Absolutely. yourself. And and then use the idea framework, which is identify, delegate, eliminate, and automate to actually free up your time and say no mm -hmm. more often, right? So yes. there's people who say no to things that actually help free up your time. Brilliant. Okay. So what are your kind of three top tips based on that that we've discussed? What would you say the three top tips that you'd offer as advice to people who are on that journey? 
I would say if you do not have somebody, if, if you are a solopreneur or you're a small business owner, if you don't mm-hmm. have either an advisory board like yep. you were talking about or a you don't have a, men- a, yeah, a paid advisory board and if you don't have a paid mentor, you need mm-hmm. to figure that out quickly. Um, yep. that is absolute, it's an absolute must because you're just not, you know, you either are not playing at your top game and, you know, I mean, Tiger Woods still, you know, he's a wildly successful golfer, still pays a coach to teach him, you know, swing mechanics and everything else. Mm-hmm. So yep. every top athlete in the world and every top entrepreneur that I've ever met has mentors that they can go to. And most often they're paying for those mentors. Mm-hmm. Um, you yep. know, and I mean, sometimes that might be, you know, I mean, I, I looked at one and I just didn't have it in my budget, but I figured out how to do it. And I mean, it was yeah. a really big check. It was one of the biggest checks mm-hmm. I ever wrote to somebody, <laughs> but that one thing turned into a seven figure exit from my business. One thing. Perfect. And, yep. and the, what I had invested was about an eighth of that. Um, and last but not least, you know, what I would say is you've got to you've got to look at your business and say, am I maximizing what the business can do? Um, mm-hmm. If you are, let's say, a physical business, what can you be doing on the Internet? And most people mm-hmm. will be like, oh, well, I, I you know, I don't have any way of doing that. No, everybody has different ways of making money. Everybody has yep. different skill sets and things that you have experience at, um, you know, in my practice, one of the things I realized was I don't want to work with individual clients as much anymore. I want to work with a small subset of clients, but mm-hmm. I still need to help all those other people. So I developed um, and am launching very, very quickly here a, uh, yep. a new program that is me taking people through the, the Freedom Day process without necessarily me being there. Um, it's an online it's a, kind of course. Yeah, it's yeah. an online course that's, you know, much more affordable. And then mm-hmm. if they reach a point where they're like, you know what, I really need somebody to help, then I'm there and I'm available to them, but I need them to get through that first. So mm-hmm. that's okay. another revenue stream for me at that yeah. point. You know, and then Perfect. I think the last thing is you need to make sure, especially if you're an entrepreneur, if you're who I was, who was working myself to death, you've yeah. got to stop. And you've also got to not feel bad when you step away from the business for a week's vacation or something. Yeah. Um, I just just in the last seven years, I have taken one seven week vacation. Why? Yay. Because one, I just didn't feel like I could be away from the business. And two, I didn't trust the people that work for me. And I have consciously worked on building my team to where they can take advantage or, you know, they can actually work without us being there. And my wife and I, you know, my wife is even more controlling than I am sometimes. And (laughs) she's like, well, I can't, you know, I've got to be there. And I said, we're paying people to be there. Why are you there also? We've got to trust them. We got to trust them that they're going to make mistakes and we can't come in and beat them in the face and say, well, you made a mistake. It's just, okay, you made a mistake. What do we do differently next time? But I need them and I'm working super, super hard that in the next 24 months, we're going to take a full month away from the businesses, all of them. And Mm -hmm. we're just going to go over to Europe. We're going to probably go to France and spend a month in France. Um, I'm going to buy some real estate when we're over there just to have a little bit of fun. But nice. we need to be able to step away from the businesses. And I want to be able to have maybe a 10 minute call on Monday morning with my team. All right. What's going on for the week? What have you got? What you know, is there anything you need what from issues? me? Other than mm-hmm. that, I'm done. Don't call me unless unless the building's burning down and I expect you to call <laughs> yeah. the fire department first. And if somebody's robbed it, call the police department because I can't help you. Other than that, yeah. I don't expect to talk to you until next Monday. Yeah. And that's what we call letting go with the EOS, right? It's like if yeah. you can actually build up the structure and the accountability and the people around you, you should be able to let go. Um, and that's when life really does become, um, you know, doing what you love with people you love and having yeah. time to pursue other stuff. <laughs> well, it beca- it's when yeah. you become a business owner instead of an mm. operator. Uh, that is, that's agree. the yeah. biggest difference. Don't be yes. an operator. 
be an owner of a business and an owner of a business does not work in the business. No, completely agree. Jeff, um, we could talk all day. I know we could, but we are running out of time. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been great to hear your side of the story because obviously we've talked before about my side of the story. Yep. Um, love the stuff that you shared there. If somebody wants to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Uh, a couple of different ways. So if you want to kind of mm-hmm. follow the Freedom Day journey, um, I would yes. recommend listening to our podcast. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the freedomnationpodcast.com. Um, Mm -hmm. I share actually other people's stories. Deb's been on there before. So uh, we, uh, you know, I share people's stories that have gotten their freedom. Uh, Certainly, Mm -hmm. you can reach out to me directly, uh, Jeff at Jeff Kickle. So J-E-F-F-K-I-K-E-L dot com. Um, I'm more than glad to do that or connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram. Mm -hmm. Those are my two places or my jams. Uh, mm-hmm. love to connect with you and I love to have people all over the world that I work with. Brilliant. And also we should mention the book because the book will be ready yes. by the time this podcast comes out. So the book is on freedomdaybook.com. Is that right? Yes, it is. Freedomdaybook.com. So uh, yep. for the for the listeners, um, you'll be able to go on there uh, and get the first chapter for free, which mm-hmm. kind of tells my little story that I told at the beginning here. Um, but also... Uh, for those of you that download that and, and your Deborah's listeners, um, we'll actually give you uh, a really, really discounted price on the book uh, as well. Fantastic. So, oh, that's awesome. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much. Always a pleasure you, to talk friend. to you. Really appreciate your time. And we'll keep in contact. Talk to you soon. Excellent. I look forward to the next time you're over here on this side of the pond or I'm on your side of the pond. So <laughs> We're definitely going to have to catch up in person. I agree. Thank you. All right, my friend.